So we're going to actually um, switch gears a little bit and go to the second high leverage teaching practice that we're going to talk about today. And again, we will be talking about it in the context of the um, project-based language learning experiences that Rachel and Adam have facilitated. So the second one is actually called Building a Classroom Discourse Community. So Rachel let us right into that. And what this means is that the teachers are going to facilitate opportunities for what's called talk in interaction. Um, and part of that talk and interaction, in fact, a really critical piece, is this idea of um, what, they, what the authors call an IRF um, protocol, which is in the teacher initiates for example, a small conversation, um, a dialogue, something they're going to do with the students. And the students respond in the target language, and then the teachers provide feedback, which is very different from providing evaluation. So we know in a lot of classes, you know, if the teacher asks the student a question in the target language, um, such as, what do you like to do on the weekends, right? And the student says, I play soccer, the a teacher might then say, oh, very good. But very good isn't feedback, it's really an evaluation. So we want to provide feedback that lets the learner know, you know, what, how their response worked in that conversation. Um, and it could, pro it could be by providing a follow-up question or there are a lot of other ways to provide feedback, if, especially if the learners need a little more direction and guidance in answering that question. Another piece to building a classroom discourse community is engaging learners in oral classroom communication between the teacher and the student. And to make that possible, you really have to have familiarity with and among the students. Most of us as language teachers, I think in a way we find this easier than almost any other subject because we spend so much time engaged with our students and having our students tell us about them in the target language, but it is really critically important to build that familiarity. Um, another piece of engaging them in that oral classroom communication involves creating the contexts in which the learners can interact in the target language, including spontaneous interaction and just chit chat. So when I was in class with my learners, it wasn't just the lesson that was me being 90% or more in the target language. It was any time I saw my students in the hallway, when they entered class, between activities, I would do all the chit chat in the target language as well. Um, and you wanna build on the context that the um, teacher and learners share, and namely the school and the community, if you're looking for some ways to build in some of that uh, spontaneous interaction, there's a whole bunch of resources just right within your school and community of topics that your learners will have some knowledge of and have opinions about that can be harnessed. Another aspect of building a classroom discourse community is designing and conducting oral interpersonal pair and group tasks. So that would be student to student because they can't just interact with me as the teacher. Also, we need to help them understand, um, or rather, we as the teacher need to understand the critical characteristics of interpersonal communication and presentational communication. And we need to provide support to students um, to use conversational gambits. And Rachel mentioned that word a little bit in our last conversation. These are language chunks. They do all kinds of really important things in conversations, but they aren't necessarily things we remember to actively teach, but we should. For example, the chunks that we use to make a point, or to interrupt, or to ask for clarification, or to ask someone to repeat, or some, a way that we in our target language or our home language might restate a point or go back to a previously mentioned point or hesitate or stall for time. We want to give our learners the tools to do that so that they can engage naturally in these conversations. And finally, we need to provide interactional space. And one of the ways we do this is actually by slowing down the churn taking between the two or three individuals who are talking and really increasing the wait time. And that can be hard because it means we have to resist the urge to fill that gap of silence. And if we do resist the urge and we, get, we don't have this frenetic pace of people feeling like they have to respond instantaneously, 
what happens is that the learners are less anxious and they become more willing and more capable of providing detailed and complex responses. So we're going to look at how this particular high leverage teaching practice comes out in high quality project-based language learning experiences. And um, my first question, um, some teachers fall into a sort of a trap that gets talked about a lot when we look at writing and research on project-based learning. And the trap is doing projects but not true project-based learning or project-based language learning. And as a result, the learners often culminate their study with a presentational communication task, primarily for the teacher. So how do you provide learners with multiple contexts for authentic interactions within and beyond the classroom as an ongoing part of the events in their project-based language learning experiences. And Rachel, I'm gonna throw it to you to start. Okay, um, so I think maybe an easy way to think about it, and there is a lot, there are a lot more differences than I will mention, but when you think of the sort of projects or what we just call dessert projects, you know, PBL or PBLL is really much more about the process than the final project. So those, you know, just project type, which I have done and I'm not, you know, demeaning anyone who does them because I've done plenty of just normal projects and not PBL projects, particularly before um, I learned about PBL. So I think those are really much more focused on the product while PBLL is really on the process. So I think, you know, thinking of it long-term, planning it out. Um, also in the planning, building in flexibility. I think it's important to sort of gauge what is working, especially when it's your first time with PBLL, you know, kind of have some flexibility as well. If this didn't work, you know, what's another direction you could take? Um, so even though you do plan things to plan for a certain uncertainty or a certain flexibility, um, in my case, luckily, students were able to interact with other students from Brazil through a separate project called Teletandem, so they were able to have this regular interaction. In addition, I was able to bring in guest speakers, and in my nature and just the way I teach, I always do a lot of small group and pair work, so they are able to sort of, you know, feel this community and have this interaction together as well and interact with me. Um, and another advantage that I often have in my Portuguese classes, I'm the only Portuguese instructor at my university. So I know I will see my students usually for two to four semesters. So I am able to build this relationship over time. Although I know not everyone has that luxury. Absolutely. Um, I really like what you said at the beginning about, first of all, that projects have a place um, in the work that we do, but their purpose is different. And, and as yeah. you said so nicely, they focus on the product um, and PBLL focuses on the process in addition to having some, some other components that are necessary. Um, and those interactions that you purposefully plan for, and I think that's what comes out, is you purposefully plan for opportunities for your learners to not just interact with people at the end as part of their culminating event in the project-based learning experience, but to have opportunities throughout the process to interact with different people who are speakers of the target language and who are experts in their own right, the peers who are experts in what they see in the children's stories, as well as the guest speaker that you mentioned from the university. Adam, I know you have some great ideas on this too. What would you like to add? Um, so um, I, I've already mentioned some of them and the fact that we do most of our work in groups so that, that projects are, are truly collaborative, but we really try to, to have, uh, have activities in different stages through the whole project process. So the students have some opportunity to interact with other groups of students and present what they're doing or, uh, or give uh, feedback in ways I've already discussed. But maybe one way to, to, to dive into this more deeply is to share a little bit about a different project that we do. We have our seventh grade students design a template for what they think would be the ideal mobile phone app. 
And this is something that with 12 and 13 year old kids, they love their phones. And if you have them to think creatively of what they would want their phone to be able to do for them, they have lots of ideas. And then in a, in a, gr in a group of 22, they'll, they'll draw out a sketch, have some, some basic vocabulary about what it should do. We post them all around the room and have a gallery walk and then have the students give little, little bits of feedback and vote on their favorites um, models for this. We, and, and then we end up doing this as a contest, the six uh, 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 templates that, that get the, the most votes end up being the projects at, go, moving forward. And the students who are not chosen, then they become members of the team with that person. And then they have roles of, you have the, the, the inventor, who is a person who presented initially. Then other kids have to decide, are they going to be a marketer? And then they have to design an advertisement for this, or a designer, where they have to develop what the, um, what the various uh, functions within the app will be like, and so on. And suddenly this becomes a, a, a collaborative process. But you know, before they went there, they had to have a little mini presentation with each other that had some high stakes because they all wanted to have their, their own uh, design chosen. And then even as they move forward with that process, there's various steps where they're going to be sharing uh, with different groups about what their ideas are and get some feedback that way. So that, 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 that all of this is embedded with like little mini presentations as they, as they go along to, to build to their final presentation. So you brought up a couple of really important points there. Um, one of them being that personal um, kind of motivation and buy-in to the topic um, and something that is relevant to the students. And that came up right at the outset when we first heard about the projects that you both are doing. Um, and also that sense of really being thoughtful about from the beginning, um, whatever the entry event might be, or how you get this started all the way through the process, building in multiple opportunities for them to collaborate and interact with each other, you know, as well as potentially having opportunities to interact with others, but not just them working in silos, developing something on their own um, without any collaboration with each other. So what do you see as the relationship between this particular high leverage teaching practice of building a classroom discourse community and the high quality project-based language learning elements of intellectual challenge and accomplishment, collaboration, or authenticity. Adam, why don't you start? So one big challenge we have working in our school with middle school students who've been studying Chinese for six or seven years up to then is, is oftentimes uh, our, our adolescent students start to reject the idea of, of speaking Chinese all the time. It's not so cool anymore. They don't necessarily want to please their teachers when they were younger. Um, so, so our rationale for doing more and more project-based language learning is to, is to create truly interesting and cognitively challenging uh, projects and tasks that, and that, that will that ideally will connect to their own lives somehow. So I've already mentioned the app project, you know, again, mo mobile app, I'm all over that. I love my phone and, and, and uh, I'll, I'll have more buy-in if I can show my creativity that way. Um, but in addition, we also are doing more work to, to connect uh, projects with what kids are studying in their own, in their other subjects in their English language uh, classes. So this might mean that uh, uh, we have a design lab and the students are having to design uh, uh, things for 3D printers. So we decided, okay, well, we're learning about the first uh, Chin Emperor. We're learning about the terracotta soldiers he built for his tomb. Why don't we have the students create their own terracotta soldiers using a 3D printer, but then embed more uh, language learning elements to make a true project-based language learning where they have to develop a story and a name for this person and have an icon that the that the soldier is carrying that tells something about their background and then develop this further and then this is able to to again uh, show their creativity in classes outside of Chinese. Um, they can talk about it in English if they need with our, our design lab teacher, but then find ways to to develop uh, their, their language skills further as they develop their stories behind that. You know, one of the things you brought up actually just hit home because we have a dual immersion program in my school district as well. And in a meeting I was having with the dual immersion coordinator at that site, he happened to just be mentioning the same thing you said, which was as the kids get older, it becomes more and more challenging to convince them to maintain their use of the target language. Um, not 
you know, in class not so much, but you know, you, we, they were hoping to hear this rich use of target language on the playground and you know, when the kids are at lunch in middle school and they're not. Um, so I kind of see this as a potential really interesting avenue for, I don't know if research is the right word, but like some development and work around this because I think this is an interesting um, problem that maybe other, it's not just your dual immersion school and my dual immersion school <laughs> are facing. Um, so you approach that really well with the use of project-based language learning experiences that create these cognitively challenging but both, but interesting and relevant tasks for learners so that there's, they really want to engage in this work and be in the language and also that really critical piece of connecting to the other content areas that's not only going to help them stay in the target language but it's going to just facilitate their academic achievement all across the board um rachel what would you like to add um yeah i mean i think to echo sort of some things that Adam said, that voice and choice is really important for the project buy-in. You know, I'm working with adults, so it's a little bit different, but having them feel invested in what they're doing, I think is really important. And I mean, I think, you know, crafting sort of a more meaningful learning experience where they're able to use the language and you're reaching beyond what's in the classroom outside to either your community or your target language community. Um, I think those are important pieces in keeping it relevant, keeping it interesting, keeping it exciting for them, um, and also intellectually challenging as well. I think all three of us are kind of hitting on the same thing from our own experiences in the classroom. And, you know, for me, I noticed that when, when we did these project-based language learning experiences, the other benefit, the other thing that that provides is our learners stop seeing their time in our language classes as purely an academic exercise because they really do come to see that the language and the cultures that speak the language have value for communication. There's value to understanding them. There's value to being, they, there's a purpose beyond the work we do in class. And they don't always feel that with all of their subject areas. So that becomes a critical point and they end up wanting to engage in the work more if we are building in voice and choice and if we are um, giving them opportunities to do that relevant work that's both relevant to them personally out of personal interest, but that they also see as relevant to something beyond their classroom, beyond their school, beyond themselves. Can I just um, yeah. throw in a little thing because I'm seeing some comments. Yeah, I think, you know, if you can find a partner to work with, that's awesome. You know, I would say exploit your own connections, you know, look for friends or maybe colleagues that you have from target language communities and they'll probably be more than willing to work with you. I know as language teachers, I'm going to say it, we're naturally nerdy, dorky people. You know, we get excited by this kinds of stuff. And if somebody said, I want you to guest lecture, I want you to be part of my project, I would be more than happy to do that. So I would say, you know, just exploit your connections. It's so easy. I mean, look at this webinar. People are tuning in from all over. It's really easy these days to connect with people, with other classrooms, with other teachers. So... I mean, take advantage of it. 